Hello, everybody, and welcome to the very first episode of the Unfiltered Artist Podcast. I'm your host, Julie Ruby, and I am so excited to finally be launching this podcast. And I want to specifically thank all of you for whoever supported me in the past and is also currently tuning into this podcast. I really, really appreciate you guys. And as the name states, this podcast will be completely unfiltered. I'm talking raw real, no gatekeeping whatsoever. We are not holding back. I'm going to be completely transparent with you guys about everything, whether it be business or struggles as a makeup artist, how to balance different things in life while also juggling a career as well. We are going to be talking about all of those things on this podcast, so get ready and strap in because I'm really excited to share these things with you guys. Some of these episodes I will be filming solo, but I do have a really amazing guests that are scheduled to come on the podcast for the next couple of episodes. They are actually going to be two people that I have previously had as my makeup assistants, and I've also assisted one of them with their weddings as well. We have very special things planned to so make sure you add this playlist to your favorites so you get notified of every single one of the episodes that launches. Okay, let's go ahead and get on to this first episode. I decided to title it where it all started because I wanted to specifically share with you guys my journey as a freelance makeup artist, what my career looked like, what jobs I had, and my very weird beginner mistakes that I first did. And my goodness, were they tragic. <laughs> so I just wanted to share little tidbits and stories with you guys along the way. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get on into it. I am for those of you that are um, watching this on YouTube, I do have a laptop sitting next to me because I digress quite a bit. And if I did not have any sort of notes by me, I would be all over the place <laughs> as per most of my YouTube channel is. I guess I'll first start off when I was graduating from high school. It was really heavily pushed on the majority of us to just go right into college. Like if you did not go into college, you were not going to succeed. Nowadays, there is a whole plethora of different career opportunities and you do not have to go to college to succeed. Like there are millionaires and billionaires even out there that have never gone to college and built a very, very successful career for themselves. I do want to advise you guys right now that if you do not know specifically that you want to go into college, I would wait a few years. <laughs> like do not spend thousands of dollars and take out student loans on an education that you're not sure of. It is very expensive. I'm still in the process of paying back those student loans and I'll probably continue to pay on those student loans until I'm 50. I've already accepted my fate. So yes, I do highly encourage people to think about it. Um, you do not necessarily have to go to college right after high school. Just take a few years and think about it. Consider it your gap year. But anyways, um, back to my story. Sorry, uh, digressing. When I was 18 years old, I went to college and originally my major was psychology. I wanted to be a family and marriage counselor. And this was solely based on the fact that a lot of people in my school told me that I was a really great listener. And that's the reason why I wanted to pursue this career. It really didn't stem from anything else. So um, took a bunch of psychology classes and didn't really find it as interesting as I thought I would. I thought about it and I go, okay, what can I do that will easily transition a psychology degree and I not have to take like additional classes to graduate with another degree? Well, I thought back on my childhood and I was obsessed with criminal minds and CSI. So what did I do? <laughs> I decided to declare criminal justice as my major. Yes, I was really convinced that I wanted to be a forensic detective and wanted to become the next detective apprentice. I was going to get there and that was my new goal in life. Well, I started taking those criminal justice classes and then soon realized that I did not really have an interest in that either. At this point, I think I pretty much had an identity crisis. <laughs> I'm sure that a lot of college students can relate. Um, it's just finding out the things that you originally thought you wanted to do in life are not really for you. And so you kind of spiral a little bit. That was the phase I was going through at that time. It was around 2014 and 2015 at this time. Well, this was the time when YouTube <laughs> came into the game. And this is going to sound so typical because you guys are going to be like, oh, well, you do YouTube now. So that makes sense. Well, no, at the time, <laughs> I really had no intentions of being a YouTuber or anything. I did not want to um, be on a public platform like this. I hated the sound of my own voice, <laughs> which is really funny now because I'm doing a podcast. Um, but at the time, I did not want to publicly show up on any sort of social media platform where my peers could judge me or my family could judge me because I was really afraid of that at the time. 
So instead, I just went down the normal YouTube route where I fell in love with the beauty community on there. I followed the really OG content creators like Jaclyn Hill, Naked Tutorials, Manny MUA, and then I also followed a bunch of Asian creators as well. There, of course, was Michelle Phan, but I also believe that there was another content creator too called Jen. I don't know what exactly her channel name was. And then there was also another channel called Bub's Beauty. Well, I like to follow those three creators because I am Asian myself and it's really, really hard to do hooded eyelids. <laughs> yeah, so at the time I was trying to look up channels that would help me with my hooded eyelid situation and how to properly do makeup on them where your makeup isn't just lost in the folds of your eyelids. So that's why I spent a lot of time researching things and I was not only just focused on techniques at the time, I was also focused on the products that everybody was using too. And of course, everybody was using very high-end cosmetic brands like Urban Decay, MAC Cosmetics. But of course, I wanted to get all these high-end makeup products because I was like, dang, maybe this is the reason why their makeup looks so good is because of the products that they're using, right? And we've all thought that in our lives. I'm sure that a bunch of makeup artists still feel that way, but it really does go down more so to techniques than anything, which I'll get into in future podcast episodes. So during my senior year, I roomed with two different people um, that I'd met in classes overlapping with me. So um, I would watch these YouTube videos and then not only practice on myself, but whenever they had special occasions or whenever we all went out together, I would do their makeup all the time. Eventually, I figured out that I liked doing other people's makeup way more than I liked doing makeup on myself. That really, truly inspired me to want to become a makeup artist and just solely do makeup on other people. And that was really my first experience with this. Being the obsessive person that I was about the beauty community and about makeup in general at that point in time, I was in Ulta at least once a week, if not twice a week, spending the last $50 that I had in my bank account <laughs> from my minimum wage job that I was working. I was literally such a broke college student. I was surviving off of these stereotypical ramen noodles and hamburger helper. It was happening. So some weeks I would literally starve myself in order to spend money on makeup. And I wasn't buying the cheap L'Oreal Maybelline sort of makeup. No, no, no. Your girl was out there buying the high-end makeup because that's what I saw all these beauty creators using. And I was like, okay, my makeup's not going to look good if I don't have this makeup. So I bought the exact things that they recommended and I collected thousands of dollars of worth of makeup. I put myself in so much credit card debt. I think I was about like $5,000 in credit card debt, guys. Like I'm kid you not, it was a for real problem for me. And I was also eventually going to talk about um, my money situation and finances and everything in future episodes. So let me know if you guys would like to hear something about that. I do also want you guys to keep in mind that this was the time where this very dramatic makeup was happening. We're talking like the full coverage matte foundations, liquid lipsticks, and the Anastasia dip brow pomades. <laughs> The amount of girls that I saw walking around with Sharpie eyebrows really kills me, okay? It was definitely an era of makeup and one that I hope never is repeated because that was not a fun time for any of us. We're all looking like clowns and very fake and filtered and definitely not natural at all. So I was a frequent visitor of my Ulta store, so frequent <laughs> that I ended up befriending one of the managers that worked for Alta. Now, she actually ended up being the prestige manager, which prestige is a term that Alta likes to coin for their high-end cosmetic section. I was like, okay, I need to get a job here in order to get makeup experience because I really truly thought like everybody else in the world that by you getting a job at Alta, you really will get the training that you need. You'll get to apply makeup on people all the time and it's just gonna be a fun experience, right? Well, I'm very sorry to burst most of your guys' bubble, but um, this is not what you're going to get to learn at Ulta, okay? Ulta is primarily a cashier-based position and is a full-on retail job. Like, you are getting stuck at the register about 90% of the time, pretty much arguing with middle-aged women all the time about how their $350 off $15 coupon does not work on the prestige brands of cosmetics. Well, anyways, I put in my application for the Alta store online, and luckily that prestige manager that I ended up befriending did give me a really good recommendation to the actual store manager. I started off as a regular beauty advisor, which is pretty much a glorified 
certified cashier position. And then eventually, I think about three or four months later, I did get promoted to the prestige beauty consultants, which to be fair, did let me get onto the floor a little bit more often and sell the high-end cosmetics to people. The other thing that I got to do as a prestige consultant was also do mini makeovers on people. Every once in a while, brands like Urban Decay or It Cosmetics, uh, Bare Minerals came in a lot too. A lot of the times these would mostly happen around um, times where they have like a new product launch or something, we would be responsible for not only doing makeup applications on people who came in for the event, but we were also responsible for selling the products that they were promoting as well. These were fun events and all, but um, keep in mind that Ulta does not properly train you. So we were just out there willy nilly, just slapping products on people's faces without having any sort of inkling on how to color match people. And we were also expected to get like a full face and makeup done in like 25 to 30 minutes. Unless you were a film and television makeup artist that's doing a very natural makeup look, it's nearly impossible, okay? We were also, again, in the time where everybody was in their dramatic makeup phase. So we were asked every single time to do these really, really dramatic makeup looks on people and expected to get it done in that 25 to 30 minute time period. It was not happening. <laughs> my life completely shifted when my Ulta was the first Ulta store in my area to get a Mac boutique inside of it. If you were around during that time, Mac was the it brand. They were the brand that makeup artists always sought to work for. Like if you worked for Mac as a makeup artist, you had made it. This was also the era of all the Mac lipstick collections on YouTube as well. Like everybody had those really insane Mac lipstick collections, including myself. I frequented the Mac counter at Macy's all the time. And I think had amassed like 50 MAC lipsticks, which realistically for one person does not make sense. Well, after this MAC boutique opened, I was like, man, this is the thing that I need. This is the position that I need to get in my life. If I do not get this position, I'm just gonna quit. I'm not going to go any further. They notified us that there would be three positions available, but two of those positions already got taken up by outside um, employees uh, that worked at MAC previously. So. Realistically, there was only one position that they were hiring for internally. I put in my application almost immediately. And within probably a couple weeks, I was contacted to get interviewed by Mac. A lot of the times you will hear nightmare and horror stories about Mac interviews and how they're the most wild makeup interviews that you'll ever do. Usually what you do is you go in person for that interview. You have a normal like question answer, sit down style interview. Hey, why do you want this job? What makes you qualified for this? What are your best and worst qualities. Your second interview is a practical where you are there in person and doing makeup on a model of your choosing, which is very intimidating as I'll get at. Well, at the time, um, the hiring employee actually was going to some sort of um, like conference for the company and she was on a like 10 hour road trip or something, which meant that we had to do our interview virtually. I literally did it from the comfort of my own house, specifically in this actual bedroom that I'm in right now in my house. I already knew that my model was going to be one of my sister-in-laws and I practiced my look on her for days leading up to this Mac interview. I actually lucked out in a overall sense of the Mac interview process because number one, I was doing it virtually. So I wasn't even face to face with the person, which is less intimidating. Number two is that I was not going to be subjected to having my model being switched around on me. And number three is that it wasn't close enough that people could see my technical abilities. Like they could not see my foundation match was really off. My eyeliner was not straight. <laughs> My lip liner was crooked. Like it was a hot mess, guys. I was a complete beginner and it was a really horrible makeup job. So I promise you that if I had done that interview in person, I don't think I would have gotten hired. <laughs> Anyways, after I got done with the interview though, the interviewer said, hey, so I'm gonna you know, meet with my team. We're gonna go over your interview and everything and then get back to you within a week. And so I said, okay, cool. Guys, that was the longest freaking week of my life, okay? I really, really wanted this job. And again, I would have quit my entire makeup career or me pursuing makeup if I did not get this job. Like this was the end all be all situation for me. So within that week, I did get a phone call back and I got hired by Mac and I could not believe it. And I'm so happy that I got that job. If I did not have that job and have the experiences that I had on that job, I definitely would not be the makeup artist that I am today. Okay, so this is where the fun part happens because after I got hired by Mac, 
I went into a week-long training program of theirs, and this is mandatory, I believe, for any of the new hires with MAC. They don't really necessarily expect you to be a professional makeup artist. Like, that is why they have this certification program, a mini makeup academy, pretty much, um, that they like to call basic training, okay? <laughs> it's literally a boot camp for makeup artists. You're not only learning about the products and how to sell things to people, but you're also learning about the technical knowledge of how to do makeup. So that's where we go over, like, color theory, foundation matching, makeup for different eye shapes and skin tones, um, how to apply false lashes. Obviously very helpful as a new beginner makeup artist. Like I really didn't know anything beyond just my YouTube knowledge. This is the first time that I kind of felt like I had made it because they flew us, not made us drive like they flew us on a plane um, out to Chicago which I don't know if this is their only headquarter location in the United States um, but I specifically live in the Midwest in Indiana so Chicago is obviously very close to me we were put up in a really nice hotel every single day we had to wake up and go by taxi to their headquarters and training facility which was very cool by the way there's not many people that actually get to see their headquarters we actually got trained by a trainer that had done lady gaga's makeup in the past i was fangirling like i was honestly like oh my gosh this person has touched lady gaga's face <laughs> so yes um i was feeling real special at the top of my game at this point i was absorbing all the knowledge that week at the very end i remember that um the last day was false lash application day well my plane amongst one other person's our flights left slightly earlier, so we had to leave about like a couple hours earlier that day. And then all the rest of the people in the class were able to stay. Their flights were a little bit later. So I did not actually learn how to apply false lashes to people. Now, this is going to come full circle here in a minute. So when I got back to the Mac store, <laughs> um, I was greeted by my two coworkers, which both of them actually had about 10 to 15 years of prior Mac training at that point in time. Like they had been employees of Mac for a while. One of them came from the Macy's store that I frequented a lot and she actually recognized me and she's like, oh my gosh, hey, like I've seen you all the time. I'm like, yeah, you know me from the 50 lipsticks that you probably sold me. And then the other employee was from a Mac Pro store in Florida. And funny story, um, she actually worked with Patrick Starr, like the Patrick Starr that owns One Size Beauty that has the very successful YouTube channel. Yes, that Patrick Starr. Those two were co-workers. I got to share stories with her about him and working with him and what that was like. And she said it was like a very cool person and chill and they hung out all the time. And I was like, this is so strange. <laughs> Besides just the weekends, I believe, we didn't really overlap on shifts that much. So I think it was like a weekday when my very first shift happened, I want to say. So I at least had a good like three or four days where I was working by myself without those two. And I literally spent those three or four days convincing people that they didn't need false eyelashes solely based on the fact that I did not know how to apply them. I was trying to wait until the weekend where I could grab one of my coworkers and ask them to show me how to apply false lashes. I think that we went into like the next weekend or something and then got extremely busy and nobody ended up showing me. So then I went into the next week and finally had my very first um, shift solo where I had to do a makeup application on somebody that was dead set into getting false lashes on their face. And this was because they were a stripper actually, and there's no judgments whatsoever. Like you do what you need to do. <laughs> there's no judgments. The reason why she wanted false lashes was because obviously she wanted to have them be able to stand out when she was on stage in front of bright lights. Well, she picked out the most dramatic false lashes that Mac had and being Mac employees, like you had to apply MAC lashes. And MAC lashes at the time, I believe were $17. They might be upwards of $20 now. Very high price for what the actual quality of them were. If you guys have ever tried to apply MAC lashes to yourself or other people, they are the hardest freaking things to apply. Even to this day, I refuse to work with MAC lashes, not only because of the cost of them, but also because of flexibility of the bands. Like they're not flexible at all. They're a little bit thicker. 
and the styles are just not very flattering for the majority of people and they just look very fake like they're very very old school looking lashes and i swear that you can find better quality lashes for like a dollar fifty off aliexpress we also had to work with duo lash glue like the traditional white um duo that came out of a tube like i don't even think they had the ones that came on applicators like on wands at that point in time like it was just the squeeze tubes but duo lash glue's formula is the worst I don't know if anybody else can relate, but they do not dry down very quickly at all. And if you squeeze out too much, it becomes a hot mess. And it also doesn't adhere very well. So I was using MAC lashes with the Duo Lash Glue in combination with each other. So as you can probably gather, it was going to be a disaster. I was not set up very well, and I also didn't know how to apply false lashes on top of it. So I did know that you do have to cut the lashes to be able to apply them to people so they wouldn't be droopy on people's eyelids. Well, I think what ended up happening was since these lashes were pretty much an even length on both of the sides, like the inner and the outer corner, I ended up cutting them from the inner corner accidentally on one of the lashes and then the outer corner of the lashes on the other one <laughs> which meant that it messed up the gradient on the lashes and made them look super weird i then applied way too much lash glue i squeezed out way too much because i didn't know the appropriate amount of what to put on there and i thought okay well this band's kind of thick so why don't i just apply more glue i didn't also wait for it to dry down and get tacky like you're supposed to so i applied those lashes on this person completely wet man it got all over her eyelid i also stuck it on her with her eyes closed and if you guys don't know um, this is where disaster struck because if they have too long of bottom eyelashes. It can sometimes stick to the bottom. Let me tell you that all of these beginner mistakes that I made definitely bit me in the ass hardcore. <laughs> My worst nightmare happened amongst probably every other makeup artist that's ever existed. She could not open her eyes, guys. I had officially glued her eyes completely shut the panic was real i kid you not like i'm like my heart's beating now just thinking about it and reliving this moment and i'm getting a little bit of ptsd i'm not gonna lie my mind instantly panicked because i was the only one keep in mind that was working at the mac boutique at this point so no other person was around me to let me know how to fix this <laughs> so i had to problem solve um i instantly went to go grab a q-tip put a makeup remover on the q-tip and slowly and individually one by one detached each of her lashes when i tell you that i spent probably a good 15 minutes unsticking her lashes from the false ones i'm not exaggerating <laughs> it took a really really long time and i don't even know how this girl was not mad at me i was able to 100 percent play this off like this was an intentional purposeful thing and i was like oh yeah like sometimes this happens like it's okay uh yeah the fake it till you make it mentality it was definitely a real thing and it will definitely get you places in life but the inner panic was real her inner corners of her lashes were popping off because i used a makeup remover on her which also loosened the glue other places that it wasn't intended to. But I had given up by that point in time. I was like, listen, I'm not gonna mess around with this anymore. I'm done, okay? <laughs> I gave her the mirror and she looks at it and goes, wow, they look so good. This looks so good. And she was thoroughly convinced that I did this amazing, stellar, fantastic job at applying her lashes and she liked the style and everything too. And I was like, thank God. <laughs> so yes, I had survived my first a uh, mini heart attack of my life. Now, this is the point where I want to highly stress that I am so grateful for my Mac career. As I mentioned before, I would not be the makeup artist that I am right now or even close to having the skills that I have um, without having those two as mentors. The other thing that I wanted to mention too is that um, cosmetic retail is also a very good idea to do. Working for a brand specifically, not like in an Ulta or Sephora, you do get that brand's benefits. I think this is with all Mac employees in general, but you do get an $800 allowance annually. So you get it every single year. The company sends you a list of products that I believe also includes some of the Mac Pro items too. And you get to pick out whatever the hell you want from that list with the allowance that you have. That is the only reason why I was able to build my freelance makeup kit at first is because of that allowance. Now, at this point in time, I actually had um, started thinking about 
my life after Mac. Like I knew that I did not want to stick in Mac specifically because I didn't really like the retailing side of it. I didn't want to sell products to people. I just wanted to focus on doing the makeup application. That's where I wanted to specialize in. Um, at the time, freelancers were becoming more of a thing, branching out from mainstream companies and just being your own boss, setting your own hours, making your own rates. Like any other person, when they first decide to branch out on their own, everybody is extremely hesitant about it. Like to leave a really solid and stable source of income is a hard thing for anybody that cares anything about their finances. <laughs> um, it's really hard um, because you aren't getting that um, constant income every single week. You're not guaranteed income. When you freelance, you are responsible for advertising yourself, getting your own clients. You may make zero that week or you may make a thousand dollars that week. You never know. There was one instance where a lady came in that was getting married in the fall of that year. And I believe that it was maybe, um, I want to say like three or four months uh, prior to her wedding, I want to say. I was working the shift solo. She comes in and goes, hey, so are you guys able to come to me to do my makeup for my wedding? And I said, um, no, actually we aren't. So this is definitely an Ulta rule, but Ulta thought that um, us doing freelance work outside of the company was a conflict of interest, which meant I couldn't advertise myself. I couldn't build a website. I couldn't even build any sort of Instagram or social media pages or anything. Like people just kind of had to take my word for it. So I was like, dang, how am I supposed to get clients like this? She came in and asked me that and I go, no, I was like, we unfortunately cannot. But if you do not say anything and we do it on the down low, I can work this wedding for you. And she asked me straight up if I had worked any other weddings. And I said, oh yeah, I think you'll be like my fifth or sixth wedding, I wanna say. Guys, I straight up lied through my teeth. That was the very first wedding that I ever worked, but I did not want her to know it. <laughs> and that again is the fake it till you make it mentality. And if you act like you've done something, and just keep rolling with the punches, nobody ever knows. And I still think to this day, she had no idea that it was my first wedding. So I agreed to do her wedding. It was just going to be her and her mom. It wasn't anything crazy with like a bunch of people. If you guys want to hear my first experience with this wedding, I'm gonna do that in a separate podcast episode because I think this is a long enough episode in itself. That was really my first time that I ever got any sort of experience doing weddings on site. And I loved it, guys. That experience truly shifted my whole entire mindset. And I was like, yes, I was like, I'm quitting Mac. This is now what I want to do. I love freelancing and specifically working weddings. So the following year after her wedding, I decided to completely quit Mac. I needed then to have a job though that would allow me to be free during evenings and weekends because that was when the most events happened and the most weddings happened since that's what I wanted to focus on. So I decided to get an office job. I was actually a bookkeeper for my husband's family's electric company that they own. And that is what I did for the next five years while simultaneously freelancing. Luckily that office job was very, very flexible. They would kind of let me leave whenever for jobs. As long as I did my work, they didn't really didn't care. And eventually I got down to only working 16 hours a week meaning that my freelancing career was pretty much funding my life at that point in time and I was working at it full time. Um, and that was the best, like it was the absolute best. Well, now we're kind of getting into more current years because as of last year in November of 2023, I decided to take the plunge and start my esthetician school journey. And this was because in 2021, I had figured out that in the state of Indiana and each state's different by the way, I figured out though that I actually needed a cosmetology or esthetician's license in order to legally practice, own, and operate my business as a makeup artist, which was very unfortunate considering that I was in my late 20s at that point in time. And I was like, dang, am I too old for this? But guys, I'm so happy I did it <laughs> um, because as much as I love being a makeup artist, my job is getting very repetitive and very monotonous almost. Um, even though each wedding's different and each person that I work with is different, I'm pretty much doing the same job every single time. I'm doing the same processes every single time and I just needed something different in my life. But because of the fact that I wasn't licensed or anything, I really can't offer any additional beauty services to people like that. So I decided that in 2024, I was not going to book myself any weddings whatsoever until I graduated from school. And this was solely because the esthetician school that I am actually now in currently, we go to school on Saturdays 
So because of that, I cannot work any sort of Saturday weddings. It's now just down to Friday and Sunday weddings, which I actually have booked a decent amount of just Friday and Saturday weddings this year. Now expected to graduate in the later half of August, which I'm really, really excited about. So I'm about halfway through my schooling right now. Um, I will probably do a whole entire podcast episode on going to school and cosmetology versus aesthetics. I'm planning on talking to one of my guests about that actually because she went for cosmetology instead, but still does makeup. So yes, um, that is pretty much where I'm at in life right now, how I got to where I am right now. Um, So if you guys have any questions, I believe there is a section on each of the podcasting platforms. So like Spotify and Apple Music, I believe, don't quote me, this is like the first time I've ever experimented with any of this, but I believe there is a comment section. So if there is, go ahead and leave any of your questions or maybe even any like topics that you want me to cover in future podcasts down in the comments um, section. And for those of you obviously that are watching on YouTube, there is definitely a comment section below. So comment anything on that as well. But yeah, that is about it for this episode though. Thank you so, so much again for tuning into this episode. Not to end off like I usually do my YouTube videos, but I hope you guys do have a really great day though. And I will talk to you guys in my next episode. 